Birds, R-O-B-I-N, M-A-R-T-I-N. I've got Mitchell, the oldest, Alex, the middle, and Megan, my youngest. And um, now talk to me just whatever you, as much as you feel comfortable with, but share to me when your story began Okay. with Mitchell. Um, well, Mitchell passed away by suicide in August of 2020. And uh, he was really, really close to sister. They were, even though he lived in Florida at the time, they were very, very close, talked every day, you know. And um, my daughter passed away in 2022 by suicide. She completely, as much as you think you can break, she more so. Her, she developed, you know, PTSD and uh, personality disorder, and she was um, having dissociation really bad and she just couldn't handle it. Mitchell we were not expecting. We knew he was depressed. We knew he was in a bad relationship but we did not know until um, a Montgomery County Sheriff showed up at my door one night to tell me. And uh, yeah Megan could never I can't say I rallied either. I mean, you know, because I immediately, Megan attempted a month after that. Mm -hmm. And so I went directly from being a grieving mother to being a saving mother. I, saving Megan mode is what I call it. I just, I never grieved Mitchell until after Megan was gone and suddenly I'm grieving two kids and it's two separate ways because they're two separate personalities, you know, so there's different things that that make me think of each one and make me sad and yeah and then they have that that's yeah that's how it started with Mitchell and and of course COVID did not help as we all know. Talk to me about you know this is something that no parent wants to go through mm -hmm. and it was you said it was a complete shock and surprise hearing about Mitchell. Yeah. Um, Talk to me about what was going through your mind just when you were hearing this for the very first time, having no idea that he was struggling. Let's put it this way. I lived in a cul-de-sac and a neighbor from across the street came running over because she heard me screaming. I dropped the phone because I, I, I called my daughter to tell her. I mean, I was just screaming. I was just screaming the shock. My doctors tell me I'm still in shock, that I haven't even started the stages of grief yet that my PTSD is such that that's why I'm able to talk to you and that's why I'm able to talk to others about it so openly is because I haven't really come out of it yet. I mean, I'll never come out of it, but you know, come out of the shock of it. it it's still, I, it's still like, okay, waiting for Megan to walk in the door. And that was the difference between the two. Mitchell didn't live at home and it's, it's, it's hard and it was awful. Megan never left home. So my everyday life changed because, you know, even ordering groceries, even now is hard because I instinctively go to order, you know, Totina's pizzas and pizza rolls and things, or I don't like ordering DoorDash because it reminds me of the kids because they were so excited when I'd order DoorDash. It, it just changes every single aspect of your entire life in ways that you just wouldn't think. Calling my parents to tell my parents, you know, they couldn't understand what I was saying because I was blubbering. I mean, those moments, Megan trying to resuscitate her because um, she was at home. And my cousin actually, who was a traveling respiratory therapist, was staying with us because she was here working at one of the local hospitals. and. Thank God she was there, not for her, because now she has PTSD and it affects her work and her life. But she heard me scream and she came running in and I'm trying to do CPR and Megan, of course, that's what she does. And so she was able to get enough of a heartbeat back for them to put her on life support. And she stayed on life support for 10 days um, when I was told, you know, I needed, that she wasn't going to come out of it. So we found out that she had become an organ donor a month after Mitchell died. So I thought about it and that was really hard, but the selfish part of me said, does that mean 
that she you have to keep her here another few days and they're like yeah probably about I'm like okay I want her three more days even though because that meant now I could climb in her bed and I could put on her favorite she loved Aristocats and she loved the fox and the hound so I'd sit lie in the bed with her and I'd sleep in the bed with her and I'd play those those videos I still talk to some of those nurses that were so amazing they let me be with her never I never left Part of the community brought me over an air, an air mattress and I never left her room. You talk to me about how that has taken a toll on you as a, as a mother. Uh, well, I'm very, very paranoid about losing Alex, uh, you know, just never expected to lose them. So, you know, you have three children, you just, so I worry about him. He is in the army and he is on the army base with the most suicides of any base in the entire world. Because it's in Alaska and it's so isolating and it's, you know, for a lot of the year, it's, it's dark all the time or it's light all the time. So they have the blackout curtains. Um, he's never been really sociable. So his, his, his socializing is all on video games which the other two were bad about that too, but I think we're gonna find every teenager was during COVID. That's how they communicated. Um, I honestly don't leave the house. I don't do my own grocery shopping. I go to my doctor's appointments. I do this. Um, I, don't, I don't leave the house. Um, I now sleep in Megan's room because even though that's where she went, it oddly, I, I just feel hugged by her. I'm, I'm in her favorite blanket. Um, I still spray her favorite scents on my pillows and stuff so that I'm always, I feel, and I know it's not healthy for me, but that's, that's how I wake up every morning. I, I don't sleep much. I might sleep about four hours in a 24 hour time. Um, m my friends that are my solid core, for core friends that I've had since I was very, very young are still my solid core that I know I can, they call me and they're like, how are you today? And I can say how I really am. And they're still going to call me tomorrow. A lot of the surface friends don't call anymore because they, they don't want to talk about the great things their kid, their kid just graduated college, you know, or just got married. But. I do want to hear those things because everybody's life doesn't change. Mine did. My parents' lives changed. My son's life changed. But everybody else's didn't. But for anybody who's thinking about it and they see it as an answer to a problem, it hurts so many people. It just, I, I couldn't say enough words to say the way it hurts. I mean, my doctors have basically said you'll never you, the PTSD is just all we can do is give you coping mechanisms to, to try to you know um you know, I was going to say something else you were talking about the pain and to others that are maybe thinking about this really that they may not realize how deeply this affects and this hurts the people closest to them yeah and I know that makes me sound selfish and that may make every family member or neighbor sound selfish, but we love you for a reason. And other people love you for a reason. Megan got so involved in trying to be a, a beacon for people that she met online or whatever, friends, old friends that would talk to her about suicide or she'd be like, call me, text me. Even in my son's memorial, she was like, it's mental illness, it's, it's health, it's, it's, not, it's not about this awful deed that everybody breaks it out to be. She was very much a spokesperson, but yet as soon as someone would call her, she'd come into me crying and, or in a rage or whatever it would throw her into because she couldn't handle that, you know? She was too young. But a problem with that is, I think it's a whole nother discussion and legislation that needs to happen is 18 year olds, because she was over 18, I couldn't medically force her to take a pill.
I couldn't force her to go. I could beg her, and I did beg her, but I couldn't force her to do these things. And because she wanted to go, she wasn't going to take them. I mean, she, when she attempted the first time, the hospital sent her to one of the behavior, local behavior health places, and she had insurance, so it's not even an insurance thing. But she's sweet and kind and got to know the nurses and the doctors really well, and within four days, they let her go, believe that she was fine. She was still slurring when she came home, Maria. She was still slurring. There, there's got to be more done. Suicide has increased so much and people don't realize it because they don't talk about it. That it's now the number two cause of death between ages 10 to 34. Number two, it's surpassed homicide. In January alone, 4,000 in the United States. And, and this isn't just me coming up with numbers, that's CDC. I mean, you, you, you can look, these are real. And my mission, my goal is, you know, I'm sure your parents had the talk with you. My parents had the talk with me, you know, usually it's yearly about the birds and the bees and drugs and alcohol. Suicide now needs to be part of that talk. And parents, the resources are there. They can Google age appropriate conversations about suicide. And I, all parents are, so many are like, you know what? I'm not gonna introduce that idea into my, I'm not gonna give them that idea but you're not. They've heard about it from a neighbor, a friend, a family member. I mean, we had a little boy here that, you know, we were talking, he heard us talking about it and said, oh yeah, my, my cousin, you know, died by suicide. It is, and I have had so many people contact me through Messenger or Facebook or whatever saying, please, because I post regularly in my local groups, um, Hey, you all know who I am, just reminding you, be nice to somebody today. Ask a stranger how they're doing today because just that one question could save a life. When my son died, the way he died was very, very visible and in the public and not one single person stopped to ask him to stop or to try to save him, but they videoed it. They'll stop and save a cat. They'll stop and save a dog but not one person stopped and they videoed it and it was all over the internet. And no one will take it down because they're like, they'll just put more cameras up. My daughter saw the video. I begged her not to look. I never looked, I still haven't looked, but she did. And I, I honestly think that was the, the final snap because you can't unsee it. And, and the last thing a parent wants is that knock at the door or to have to try to resuscitate their child or to sit in ICU for 10 days watching their child, watching a machine breathe for them. There's, there's just not words to explain that pain. And I, twice, it's happened to me twice. And I consider myself, I was a good mom. I was close with my kids. I mean, I talked to my son the night before, you know, and if, and it's not just kids, because like I said, the, it goes to 34 that it's a number two. I'm not saying that's where suicide stops, because it's not. These people are not cowards. They're not selfish. They're scared, and they don't know how to get out of their head. And they're not getting the help they need, because if, if they're st still developing brains, they can't make those decisions. I mean, I honestly believe it's a whole other thing, but I think that our government should make it maybe like, I don't know, age 25 before a parent isn't able to take care of their kids' medical stuff. You know, my son was 25, my daughter was 20. And it's called starttalkingaboutit.org. We're on Facebook as well. And um, I developed that and I started making these friendship bracelets that also have the code on there and my motto is to take one to wear and take one to share. I have sent bracelets to the United Kingdom, to Canada, to Australia. I'm not, these aren't for money. I don't ask for any money. I do this because I want to save one more person. If I can save, help save, because I'm not, I'm not gonna gog complex. I'm not gonna save anybody.
But if I can help save one life, then that makes my life worth living. That's the only, that doing this, this project and speaking about it and talking about it and sharing about it, that's cathartic for me. I may not leave the house, but I can make bracelets in the house and I can talk to people online in the house. I have had people in this neighborhood come and take bracelets in the woodlands as well. I, I, they come and take bracelets. I've had delivery people, sales people that, that see the bracelets and take them and sometimes even still knock on the door and ask me to come out because they want a hug. Or um, one Amazon guy was like, my sister just attempted last Monday. He's like, you don't know how much this means to me. And I'm like, well, you're in the right place at the right time. Everybody needs to know that almost everyone has these thoughts at some time. I don't know the numbers, but they're out there. And they need to know that it's okay. As we, we've heard it said, it's okay to not be okay. Ask for help. You, and it's not weak. It's not weak. That's strong. And everybody's loved. Everybody means somebody to someone. Every single person. Every child born has a mom. Whether it's a, an adopted mom or a birth mom, they all have a mom that you don't ever imagine that being ripped away. Like, I'll never, I won't have the grandkids. If Alex has children, I'll, I'll have a grandchild, but he hasn't shown much interest in it. So, the thing, the way, those are different ways that it's changed my life is that, I mean, it's just empty. It, it's, I tried to get the word out and I try to talk to people and I'm grateful that people listen and people are so caring and giving this community, the woodlands and here and that, you know, everybody, they approve my posts when I put, you know, they, they approve them and they share it. Um, I do have people say, thank you again for reminding me. I talked to the kids tonight and this is, and I have a really close friend that I happened to be with her when her granddaughter came to her and was talking to her about something that had happened at school and that this little kid, elementary, had talked about hurting themselves. And so I was actually at the table and helped her have this conversation with her third grade granddaughter. So now, not only do I talk the talk, I've walked the walk. I know it's a hard conversation to have, but I also know how receptive that little girl was to it, wore the bracelet, took the bracelet to her friend. They need to be had, you know, they start simple, but kids need to know that they can come home and they can say, you know what, John was really getting picked on by these other kids and he was really sad about it. Because then the parent can say, well, this is what you need to do for John, right. because that can make the difference for John. Yeah. You know, it, it's just the little bitty things that can add up that makes so much difference. Yeah. Just like one snowflake eventually turns in, into a couple of inches, you know. Can you tell us about your, um, about your pins and the photos that those were taken? Um, yes. Um, last August, I had my very first roommate from when I was like 17. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She, she had lost her daughter and so she reached out to me. There's this conference every other year in Arizona, in Phoenix, called Helping Parents Heal. And it's for parents who have lost their children in any way. Okay. And so she had paid for, being, for me to go and I was gonna be there and we had all that arranged before Megan died. So, you know, Megan was April 30th, yeah. And so I was still very numb and fresh. But I went to the conference, and so every parent, they had a button waiting there for them with their child on it, and I had the two buttons, which makes it, I've noticed in my groups and things like that, it's hard for me to talk about it because everybody is going through their horror, but when they find out I've lost two, then they feel bad for feeling as bad as they do, and they shouldn't. And, but also, then now they're more fearful for their children because they hadn't thought about it. But that's another thing that needs to be spoken about is siblings of suicide, I don't know the rate, but I want to say it's like eight times more likely 
the rate for suicide goes up exponentially for siblings of suicide. But both of the kids loved horses. We didn't own any, um, but this is Mitchell on one of their favorite horses. And this is a picture that Megan took at one of the ponds, had taken at one of the ponds in the, in the woodlands by a friend of hers. And I will, let me say, my kids' friends, they still reach out to me. They call me mom. They check on me. And they reach out to me when they're not feeling so great. Um, which means the world to me because I know that's what they want. They're, they're designing this. They're making this happen. I'm learning a lot. I'm becoming more spiritual, not religious, but more spiritual. And I'm learning that my kids have a hand in all of that. They're making sure on that day that one of their friends, that they're calling me for a reason. And so, yeah, that's what these buttons are from. Yeah. And you have your own bracelet that you have on you. Yeah, this is a bracelet that one of Megan's old friends had. It's worn out now because, you know, it's been a while, but it's the colors for, su for suicide awareness, which is the, the teal and purple. Mm -hmm. And then, I, you know, I, have the, I haven't put my new one on yet, but I plan on it soon. But yeah, this is the original one from Megan's memorial that, that were made for her. And then the shirt that you have on, everything that you're wearing is like... Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to make sure that the, everything... So the semicolon, a lot of people know about it. A lot of people get the tattoo. It means, you know, a lot of people that aren't up on the grammar, you know, it, it means the story, the sentence isn't over. This conversation isn't over. Your story isn't over. And then on the back, it, it says, you know, dear person behind me, you matter. You're important. You're loved. Love the person in front of you or something to that effect. Um, and this was made for me by someone in the neighborhood who you know saw my posts and so she made this shirt for me and so I had her make a few more shirts that I sent out to friends of mine throughout the country to Boston and Florida and North Carolina and people are wearing that you, you're now seeing more of these shirts and stuff the idea of it sold on Facebook and stuff like that and people are always great about that's a wonderful idea I love that idea but a lot of them haven't lived it so yeah. I, I speak from what I know, unfortunately. I'm not afraid to talk about it. I know a lot of people don't like to talk about it. But if my kids come up, and any, how many kids do you have? I have three. What are their names? Mitchell, Megan, and Alex. How old are they? Well, yeah. and that's where I have to roll out and say, you know, they were. And then my, my son Alex is 26 because I will always be a mother of three, always and forever. So what's keeping you up at night? We're on the big promotion at work. Still sleeping on my old 